Hey. Um, so I'm Pedro Callahan. I'm an engineer here at Intercom, and I work on team messages. So kind of our day to day is basically working on the the message creation platform. So for the last six, seven months, we've been putting in place a new kind of message creation workflow. And my part of main part of my job is in working on building the the actual editor part. So I've been working a lot with content editable for better or worse. Um, so I guess this talk is just about what content editable is. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about what's content editable, um, history, um, the JS APIs surrounding it, like exec command and selection APIs. Going to talk a bit about paste, cause, um, and then just talk about some editors. So what is it? Um, so content editable is a way of just making a HTML document editable. So there's two ways of doing it. There's design mode, which I'm not going to really talk about, but essentially it's a legacy way. You just set this on the document, and your whole document can be immediately editable. And content editable, you can do it on, a, on an element um, basis. Um, so for example, here we have a heading, and we're adding the, the attribute um, content editable. And now I can edit this heading as if it was a text box. And in this heading, we can subscribe to like uh, JavaScript events, like keyboard events. Um, yeah, so we can create content and manipulate it. Um, so when people first use it, it's like, yeah, this is really powerful. It's really great. But once you start scratching the surface, it's kind of like a whole different story. Um, so a lot of people hate it. And I've kind of gone that way myself. But generally, it's because of like over the years, half cooked specifications. There's no real specifications. Um, buggy browser implementations, and just inconsistent behavior. It's pretty much the norm. It's, it's a pretty hostile environment. So where did it come from? It actually came from Internet Explorer 5.5 back in 2000. And they introduced these two attributes. And there was no specification. There's just a bit of documentation sent to developers how you use this. Um, other browser vendors then saw this and thought this actually could be a cool technology. So what they ended up doing was trying to reverse engineer what was what Microsoft had done, and they tr um, started coming up with this um, specification here, which appeared in Web Applications One, which later turned into HTML5. Um, this spec was largely unfinished. Um, there's actually a blog post from the time from the guys from Opera actually going through reverse engineering it. It's pretty interesting, but there's a lot of W2TFs in there from them. Um, so we kind of knocked around for a while. Um, didn't really get standardized. And then this year, the W3C um, came out with the HTML editing APIs. But well, that sounds great. The opening paragraph has this line, which is the API specified here were originally introduced in Microsoft's Internet Explorer, but have subsequently been copied by other browsers in a haphazard and imprecise fashion. Although the behavior specified here does not exactly match any browser at the time of writing, it can serve as a target to converge to in the future. So this is basically where we're at at the moment. Um, so as I said, content editable, you add this attribute, and away you go. But the problem is, different browsers have different implementations. So you could carry out a set of operations, like enter, delete, types and characters. And if you do that in Chrome, and do that in Firefox, you could actually get completely different markup. So when you hit enter, what happens? So if you're in a P tag, you hit enter, you get a P tag, if you're in a div, you get a div. Um, but we're going to play a little game here called what happens next. So we have a, <coughs> a content editable div, and we just have a, a D. And the green is the cursor. So what happens in each browser when I, when I hit Enter? So first up, we have Chrome. Hit Enter. Get a div. OK, that's cool. Safari, what do we get? Hit Enter. Also get a div. It's probably easy because Safari and Chrome are both based around WebKit. 
I11. I'm not even going to talk about IE8 or any of this sort of thing. We only support IE11 up in uh, Intercom here. Um, we get a P. So that's different already. So you're like, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to write code to kind of massage this. So lastly, we have um, Firefox. So okay, I'm going to hit enter. You get this. <laughs> so yeah. So this is like a single operation. I've just hit enter here. So you can imagine how out of step all these different browsers can get. Um, so this is something I came up or came up against um, recently. So in Backspace. So say we have a p tag, and just randomly I set some CSS on this of a line height of 1.5. Uh, so I have two Ds in a paragraph. I put my cursor in between. I'm going to hit Enter, and then I'm going to hit Backspace. And what should happen? It should actually just come back to its original state. What actually ends up happening is this, which is kind of, yeah, it's mangled. So what this means is, like, there's a lot of these um, kind of behavior bugs, which, yeah, I'm not really sure what you call them. But markup isn't generated consistently throughout the different browsers. So what this means is you can't really treat your HTML as a, as a data format. If you, need, if you want your users to write a document and you want to save this in the database, can you really trust it? So what you need, you definitely need, going to need some like, markup sanitization step to, to clean your DOM, or you're going to select like, a subset of HTML and say, OK, we're just going to support that and you know, clean it. So we have so content editable rather as well as just like the tag, they give us some um, JS APIs out of the box. So we have one called exec command, which allows you to do like formatting of text selections and carry out other interactions. And then selection APIs, which is for um, interacting with the carrot, moving the carrot round or um, changing text selection. And that's made up of two objects, selections and ranges. So basically, exec command, um, you pass in three parameters. You have a command, which is some sort of operation like bold, make this te text bold or italic. Um, show UI is kind of like a legacy parameter where it just pops up a dialog, and you can type into it. Say you want to turn some text into a, a link, you can type the link in this dialog. But more than likely, you're not going to use that. So instead, you'll set that to false and use the value parameter and you can then programmatically set what the link is going to be. Um, so this is what you get out of the box. So we have like kind of inline commands, so like colors and font sizes. We have block commands, which operate at a block level, and then just some miscellaneous ones like copy and paste and select all. So I'm not going to talk about all these. I'll just kind of talk about some of the more interesting ones. So if you want to make something bold and italic, this is, you just make a selection, and this is what you do. And Safari, Chrome, and Firefox, you get a B and an I tag. That's great. IE, you get strong and EM. So it's like, ah, here we go again. So we can also set font size and font name. And they've actually you know, brought back the font tag. Um, so if you set it, and as well, if you're setting font size, you can't actually set it using pixels or EMs, like using any sort of unit value. You have to pick a number between one and seven. And if you put in an unknown number, they'll just assume it's seven. Um, and <laughs> also font name, it just, if you set your font to whatever, it just applies it as an attribute here in the, the face attribute, which I'd never heard of. But um, you can also, if you don't want to do it through markup, you can do it through spans. But yeah, it's still nasty. So we have block commands. So you can insert a paragraph. But as I was showing earlier with enter, um, you know, you're not actually inserting a paragraph. Sometimes it's going to insert a div. Um, it just depends on your context. Um, and also, it doesn't work in IE if you don't actually. So in the other browsers, you can if you just have a caret, you can go stick a paragraph after this caret, or you can do it on this text selection. But in IE, 
you can only do it if it's a selection, you can't do it on just a single carrot. Um, so we have format block, which basically allows you to take some text and say, you know, wrap a block element around it, or else change this block from one type to another, so a P to a H1. Um, so Safari, Chrome, Firefox, they allow you to kind of use any block level elements, but IE only supports H1 to H6, pre and address, and you can't do it on text, you need to have a pre-format a block. We have insert HTML, which um, will be quite useful because you can just put in kind of random HTML if you want, um, you know, put classes on, stuff like that. Um, support in Chrome, Safari Chrome, Firefox, not supported in any version of IE. Um, actually, here, so if you wanted to put in some random text, what you'd have to do is you'd have to use jQuery or, you know, the DOM APIs but that's gonna have some implications, which I'll talk about later. Um, yeah, so, so we have undo and redo. So undo works in all browsers, but redo does not work in IE. Um, and the interesting thing, as I said, if you wanna insert HTML and you wanna use kind of just regular DOM APIs, what's gonna happen is that DOM isn't gonna be, see, see, <coughs> be seen by the undo stack. So the undo stack is just completely broken. So you could write uh, some text, insert an image with JavaScript, um, write some more text, and if you hit Control Z number of times, all your text will disappear, but your image will still be there. So if you want to handle this, you have to actually create your own undo stack. So we have select all. Um, so it works kind of in all browsers in that in Firefox, if you select all, you can't backspace delete, which most people, that's why they want to select all. Um, and it doesn't, it works in uh, IE, but what it does is it actually selects the whole page. So it's pretty much useless. Um, so the selection APIs, this is like, um, so these are two objects which are used to interact with um, text selection and to move your carrot around the page. So, when you look at a text selection on the page, a range is actually where you put all the, it makes up the, the text selection, so you put in a load of nodes. And you can manipulate this range, adding elements to it to create your selection, but it's not actually gonna appear on the page till you add it to your selection object. So if you make a uh, create a selection, you can get the current selection just using this window.getSelection. And you can find out where the current selection start and ends using um, these APIs. So you have anchor node, which is the start, focus node, which is the end. Anchor offset is the index of where the cursor is in this particular node. And then the focus offset is the end. And if they're all equal, um, it's actually a carrot and not a range. But one strange thing about the API is it's kind of context driven. So if my focus node is an element like a P, the, in, the offset actually means something completely different as if it was a text node. So if it's an element, the offset relates to its index in its, in its parents kind of child nodes. So here we have I is the, the node and it's offset of one because it's the first child of P or the zero one with their arrays. Um, and then the text node, um, it's actually the, it's the string value and it's the index of the string. So differences again. So how do we, so putting it kind of all together, if I want to create a text selection, so we go selection got window got get selection, then we can create a range. And then you can dump all these elements into your range, setting the offsets. Um, you remove all the ranges from the current selection, so that'll wipe any text selections away, and then you can add your, range, your new range, and then your text selection will pop up on screen. So then what can we do with the text selection? We can use exec command. You can save the current selection, do some random bit of work, and then you can actually just pop that back in there and the selection will reappear. 
Um, we can use a function called collapse, which say you have a selection, you can go collapse, and it'll either go to the end or the cart. will actually go to the end of the start, which is quite useful. Um, and you can also use this function called get bounding client rect, which you'll see on editors where if they highlight text, they actually move a box over your text so you can like hit B or I and that's how you do that. It gets your position on screen. Um, so in general, it, the API is pretty good. It's pretty consistent except for kind of one major hairy bug which kind of plagued us for a bit. Um, so in Chrome, if you have an empty text node, you can't put your carrot in there. So if you create a new node and you try to put your carrot in, it actually just sticks it outside. So you have a P tag here and the carrot's outside. So it's a nightmare. So what you do, um, a lot of kind of open source editors do this, is you put in a zero width space to actually give it width. And then you set the cursor to one. And then the thing is, once you add it, you have to remember to remove it because if you don't, and your user starts arrowing around, they'll think their cursor's stuck and your editor's broke. So it's, yeah. So next, great crack, paste, um, serious uh, can of worms. So paste, kind of two things happen. If you paste, say, from sublime text and t paste into a document, that's going to be pasted as plain text. And that's cool, it's just going to have no formatting. But if you um, paste from a HTML page into a content editable div, it's actually going to carry over all that formatting and all that HTML structure. So you don't want to save that in your document. You want to have to clean that up. Um, so there's two kind of approaches to how you could do this. One is you let the paste happen and then just run some sanitization. Um, it's kind of the easiest, but it's pretty icky, the fact that you'll get this flash of kind of content appearing and then disappearing. So the other approach is actually, there's a paste event which you can hook into. Um, and what you can do is you can actually prevent that from happening. There's, you can actually get access to the, the clipboard and you can process that content. Then using the, you can put it back in into the DOM and then using the selection API, you can put your cursor in. So, so to get access to the clipboard, you can, in the event, there's this clipboard data um, object. You just call it get data. <coughs> so you can get it as plain text or you can get it as HTML. And then you can, as plain text, it's just, you can just insert it. Get HTML, or the HTML, you'll have to clean it up. So this, this is pretty cool. Um, but unfortunately, IE has a different API, and they only expose plain text. Um, also, they have this thing called URL, which I've never looked at, so I don't know what it is. Um, and Safari, no matter what you do, is just, it's always plain text. So technically, yeah, that's fine, but our users didn't want plain text. They wanted to be able to format, like, paste formatted content. So what you have to do to get formatted HTML for Safari and IE, you have to create an off-screen content editable div. And there's a before paste event. And what in that, when you detect a paste is about to happen, you redirect your carrot to the off-screen div. The, that content will then be pasted in there. So you now have access to the HTML. And then you pull out that HTML, clean it, reinsert it, and then reinsert the carrot. And yeah, that's how you get it. <laughs> so, well, you can copy and paste like HTML from anywhere on the web. Um, we really want to support it, like our, our users most used editors online. So Google Docs being one of them. So you can detect if it's a Google Doc just by looking for this kind of ID GUID. Um, the main problem with our Google Docs is they don't use B and I tags or any of this. They, they actually just use inline CSS for everything. So you have to use regexes on their style attributes to work out if they're italic or combinations. And 
yeah, it's kind of messy. And then there's just some, um, they do use H1 to H6, but there are some um, formatting um, options that they give users that there's just absolutely no way to detect, like titles and subtitles, yeah, there's no way you can determine that this should be a H1 or something like that. Um, Microsoft Word, so Microsoft Word um, chucks all these like crazy looking O tags, or I don't know, OP tags everywhere, so you have to clean them up. In general, it's actually easier than Google Docs because they use, even though they mightn't use the proper elements, they actually have a consistent kind of classes. So MS title, MSO title is a H1 and stuff like that. Um, MS normal is a P. MSO quote is a block quote, and they do have H1 to 6. But the big thing with Microsoft Word is their lists are absolutely insane. So every list item is actually a P tag. So I don't know if you can see it here, but this has a class of list paragraph first, um, this is list paragraph middle, list paragraph last. So you can have lots of middles and a first and a last. So you have to kind of run your code and detect, like, am I at the start of a list, the middle of a list, end of a list, and then convert that to a, a UL or an OL. But yeah, unfortunately, um, that was the desktop version, and the, the online version uses different markup. So, yeah. So what they do for lists is every list item actually is its own um, list. <laughs> and how you differentiate them is they have this start attribute. Um, so, you know, one, two, three, and you have to detect when either the next element is in the list or when it resets itself back to zero or so it's yeah yeah so it's pretty fun <laughs> so content elf is such a pain what can you do so if you're google and you have lots of engineers you can not use content editable at all so what they did was they created their own layout engine to overcome this so basically when you use google docs when you see the carrot that's actually a two pixel div. They don't use content editable at all. They don't use the kind of main browser behavior. And if you do text selection, that's actually a div as well. So what they do is they intercept all your key presses and they route it to a text area off screen. So say I press A, it goes off screen. They'll measure that, work out its coordinates, and then insert it absolutely back on the page. Um, it's kind of crazy, but obviously it works. Um, so then here at Intercom, so the past yeah, several months, so Composer V1 was the first one we built, and it lent heavily, really heavily on content editable and exec command. Um, so while it worked, and it's, it's in production today, um, kind of lots, as you can see, there was lots of cross browser headaches, lots of kind of sanitization code, and kind of jumping through hoops. Um, it was hard to do automated testing. Like we have lots of tests around our periphery code and our, all our libs which we built, but to actually test kind of user interaction was pretty tough. Um, so we were actually decided to kind of go back to the drawing board, and we're currently undergoing a rewrite at the moment. So. So we have Composer V2. So I don't know if people saw there was a kind of um, there was a blog post by Medium. So we kind of taken a similar approach that they went. So we use Content Editable, but we only use it for its events and um, and the selection APIs. And um, so instead, what we have we back we back the whole thing with a model. So we have this these blocks. So our, our documents are actually broken down into sections. So here we have a, a heading, a JSON, a JSON heading, subheading, paragraph, and these have a direct mapping to HTML. So we treat the DOM as ephemeral, like we're gonna chuck it away. So what we do, we define a really strict set of edit editing operations. So, you know, you hit enter, you can hit backspace. Um, and what we do is we, we intercept those events and we actually carry out these operations not in the or not in content editable, but in our model. So our model works out these operations. So 
say I have this subheading and I'm in the middle and I hit it enter, the model then is going to detect this and it's going to split this subheading into two. Um, and then the, the blocks then creates a HTML representation, syncs it back up to the front end, and then we insert our carrot again. Um, so, so we kind of let regular kind of character events in, because um, we need that to, to get like international characters and stuff. But we flush the DOM kind of quite a lot, just to make sure it doesn't get out of sync. So say on space, um, backspace, stuff like that. So as a wrap up, Contadable is cool, but yeah, beware and know what you're getting yourself into. If um, there are lots of open source libraries, um, so you could possibly you could use some of them. Some of them are have been around for years, and they're but they're actually they're massive. Um, but if you are going the content elbow route, you'll definitely need some DOM sanitization um, um, strategy, uh, and then alternatively. You can leverage the useful bits, I guess the good parts, and then minimize using the bad parts. So, thanks. Any questions? Any questions or? Yes, you, some of them we did, but they didn't fit what we wanted. Um, they were quite, some of them were quite large as well. They kind of did everything in the kitchen sink. Um, I actually seen a, a, one recently, which actually looks really, really interesting. It's called Aloha, and they've actually just got rid of content editable as well. Um, they they kind of had a V1, and they just released V2, and I just saw they had a blog post last week, and it, actually, it's it's actually while most editors are kind of like fully featured, there's kind of just exposes all these APIs and allows you to kind of build on top of it. Um, so that one actually looks really interesting. Hey. Well, we found now that we're doing a lot of our our kind of editing operations in the model, we can test the hell out of that. So we've got like 2,000 and, and up going upward unit tests of, of this kind of, of what should happen when you hit enter in the middle of a paragraph. Um, it's still kind of hard to do user input testing. Um, so we do have some integration tests around that, but it's, it's more kind of smoke testing to make sure you know, stuff isn't broken. But the problem with V1 was that all the heavy lifting was been done in content editable, and it's just very, very hard to, to test that. Mainly because of um, triggering events, um, you need to, it's very hard to kind of do that right and, model, and mirror what the browser actually does. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Thanks very much.